Hello and welcome back to Under the Moons. My name's Adam and today we're going to be talking about the new Amazon Prime show Tales from the Loop. Now, you're probably in one of three categories. One, this is the first you've heard of Tales from the Loop. Two, you know of this series because you've seen the trailer. And three, not only do you know of this series, but you know what it's adapted from. The where involves an interesting look into a series of art detailing these strange tales from an alternative past. But the who is where we're going to start. Growing up in suburban Sweden, artist Simon Stalenhardt would often explore the wilderness around him, littered with machines from decades past. These little adventures would be the basis of what his work was based on. These digital paintings were recreations of these childhood adventures, but with a twist. While these depicted scenes still took place in 1990 Sweden, there was a clear difference in those leftover machines. The beautifully illustrated, unmistakably Swedish landscapes were joined by these large metal structures that encapsulated what makes Simon's work so unique. There was a mystery to this world. What were those strange machines? What were those large, looming, distant towers? This combination of visuals, when released online, drew in large audiences. This might be where some of you first saw these landscapes. It was for me, at least. These illustrations were compiled into the first book from Simon Stalenhag, titled Tales from the Loop. Images were connected together by the stories of a young Simon as he explored the world with his friend Olaf, and the playground tales of other kids and their interaction with these forgotten machines. This book's world takes place in an alternative timeline to ours. Post World War II, Russia starts experimenting with the effects of a new element called magnetite, and soon discovering its qualities in repelling against the Earth's magnetic field. Resulting in the effect of being able to lift large crafts into the air, the magnetite's effects condensed into these dishes we see under the crops. This breakthrough convinced other nations that focusing on research would have big payoffs. In the 1950s, Sweden created a large giant particle accelerator below part of the east coast and its island. This collider was dubbed the loop. While many breakthroughs came from the loop, the technologies they were condensed into became obsolete due to even more recent findings, hence the scattered nature of the landscape. Yet strange stories that are passed between the swing set leads the mystery of what goes on underground and what breaks out. There's some really great visuals in this book that I won't show as if this has perked your ears up, I very much recommend grabbing a copy of Tales of the Loop. Now beyond this collection of art, an amazing picture book for adults if you want to be awfully blunt about it, Simon has released two other books, one that follows on from Tales of the Loop with Things from the Flood, which I have yet to collect, and the other more recent one, The Electric State, which focuses on the wastelands of a technologically greedy United States in the aftermath of something. For me, the architecture and design of these looming towers and law-bending vehicles really does feel only a few steps away from our own history. Well, that and if the designer's vision was taken seriously in the world of industrialization. Stalinghag's designs goes for this blend of science fiction and practicality. Just by looking through the pages, you understand how these things function. A lot of the time with science fiction designs, it's encapsulated to a shiny box, or the exterior is covered with small details that admittedly work with our brain checking it as, oh, there's more detail, therefore it must function. And I think that's down just to how we see a lot of our own industrial technology. But this disconnection from understanding how our everyday items function became lost in the 1990s with the emergence of CDs. Before we played music through records, you could physically see these rigid canyons that convert into unique sounds when a glass needle ran through them. A strange one to get your head around, but easily understandable. Even with cassette tapes, while a little more complicated with the use of magnets, there was still the physical act of rewinding these tapes back to the start. Simon's world are in this pocket, this, this last bastion of analogue. And while what goes on between the pages dwarfs any of our previous technology, it still oozes a sense of relatability from the pre-digital era. I think grounding the stage with these cold, more rugged landscape only helps to push that familiarity. You really can imagine standing alongside one of these rusting machines in a dry grass field, large industrial towers looming on the horizon. For many of us in the UK, we were brought up with our own bulking towers looming in the distance in the form of gasometers, once used to contain the gas distributed to the local community. 
I think this kind of construction would very much be the basis of architecture if a Tales from the Loop scenario took place in Britain. Now, beyond his series of books, I think it's worth mentioning his dive into video games. The two-man team of Pixel Truss, Stalen Hug on design and music, and close friend Tommy Salamontus on mechanics created their own take on a 16-bit game from the 90s. In Ripple.0, you take control of a battle penguin named Dot Zero. You must push through the animal labs in hope of releasing the other nine battle penguins. Visually, it's a striking game that, while feeling familiar, nestles you into the warm embrace of games played on old CRT televisions. Its detail feels that of something that dwarfs clear inspirations like Sonic the Hedgehog and various Amiga slash Commodore 64 games. Its nod to popular of the time developer Psygnosis' logo is clear to see, toting that indistinguishable Rodney Matthews style. He might have to be a focus of another video. Gameplay wise, it's all rather solid, and I think if it was ported back in time, it would create quite a stir. Although it could be argued the game has a slight problem in finding its own gimmick, but it's still a blast to play despite this. And to finish off this section on Ripple.0, you may have noticed I glazed past Stalen Hag's soundtrack credit, because, well, this was the biggest surprise for me. This guy knows how to create some absolute 16 bit bangers. <laughs> The music I've had in the background is all from Ripple.0, all created by Stalenhag. I think this guy grabbed more than one gif when he was formed into existence. <laughs> it's very selfish. I currently have the soundtrack playing around the house which contains a whopping 38 tracks, and of course, not all are created equally. For me, the first few tracks are the standouts, with some absolutely beautiful soundscapes scattered throughout. Now, if you wanted to play Ripple.0, it's actually a free-to-play Flash game. Yeah, so not sure how much longer it will be available to play in its current form, but I'll leave a link in the description below. If you are someone that got any kind of enjoyment out of 8-bit, 16-bit, heck, any kind of side-scrolling platformer, I highly suggest giving this jetpack-wielding penguin game a go. Sticking with games that Simon's created, we can't pass over the RPG adaptations of Tales from the Loop, which sees you play as a group of 9-15 to 15 year olds as they travel through the lands encompassed by the loop set in the 80s. The game won a good deal of awards from the respected RPG bodies and was soon followed up with The Things from the Flood, which follows the now 14-19 to 19 year olds group living in the 90s. After two flooded reactors spread a disease to all electrical objects and the sudden change of magnetic poles, the group traverses through the land now littered with infected machines and downed magnetane run ships. I've never had the chance to play any tabletop RPGs, but if given the chance, I think I'd like to start with these two. Now, before we round out this video, I think it's worth talking about another piece of his art, one that's probably been staring a lot of you guys in the face for the last four years. The original 2016 No Man's Sky box artwork. Yeah, that's a Stalen hack. In fact, there's a few more pieces of concept art under his helm. So, to suggest some of the art style of No Man's Sky is part down to Stalenhug wouldn't be wrong. And while we're still talking about games, it's probably worth mentioning the 2019 survival shooter Generation Zero from Avalanche Studios. Yeah, the one that takes place in a world where after World War II, Sweden pushes research into a defence programme that saw the creation of numerous robots that patrolled the Swedish landscape. And it's now your job to travel through this countryside that's set in the 1990s. Yes, and absolutely no involvement or reported influence from Stalenhag's work. I think that's grounds for something. <laughs> so, going on what we've covered today, you would think you're ready for what to expect from Amazon's Tale of the Loop. Well, interestingly, this adaptation has, well, adapted a few things to suit that of a series. The world of the Loop has moved from Sweden to America, but still set in a location geographically similar to what we're used to. Each episode seems to be covering a different character and their experience with these strange anomalies, a more connected mythology by the looks of it. This series could also be seen as an anti-black mirror, focused on the positives and childlike wonder of strange echo spheres and lost robots. While sticking to one writer slash showrunner Nathaniel Halpern, each episode is handed off to a different director, which includes faces like Jodie Foster, who has previously directed an episode of the mentioned Black Mirror, Mark Romanek, director of films like One Hour Photo and Never Let Me Go, and a director that I'm very excited for this is Andrew Stanton of Wally, Finding Nemo, and John Carter. In a time where we're treated to such things as Stranger Things, It, and a few more stragglers holding onto the standby Goonies train, it seems like Tales from the Loop has made an effort to distance itself from its expected subgenre. There's much more of a focus on the adults as much as the kids, 
The soundtrack has gone for its own flair over submitting to the expected synth score, and the teased overall positive message about making connections with man and machine is a nice palette change in these current times. So, I hope this video has given you a nice introduction to Simon Stallon Hagg's works. And to me, well, I think he's one of the best artists to come out of the 21st century. And his collection of works bundled into this, again, storybook for adults, has influenced me a lot in some of my more recent creative endeavours. And with Tales from the Loop, now a big eight-part series from Amazon, I hope this leads the way in seeing this unique flair of forgotten future tech, bathed in melancholy landscapes, appear on our screens more often in the coming years. With how immersive these images are, the future of these worlds lay beyond the digital canvas. The modern landscape of digestible medias really is prime for the picking when adapting Stalin Hag's worlds. So there we go. Well, thank you for watching this video. And yeah, remember to check out Tales from the Loop on Amazon Prime very soon. In fact, probably now, because it's going to take me a while to do this video. But anyway, thanks for watching. And yeah, watch out for one another out there. It's, it's crazy times. And I'll see you next time under the moons. See you later.